Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bernia. On this episode, I am talking with Benjamin Lipscomb. Benjamin has his PhD from the University of Notre Dame. He's a professor of philosophy at Houghton College. He specializes in contemporary ethical theory, along with biomedical ethics, history of philosophy, and many other topics. He is, when he's not teaching, he's also writing. He is the author of the new book, The Women Are Up to Something, How Elizabeth Anscombe, Philippa Foote, Mary Midgley, and Iris Murdoch Revolutionized Ethics. Um, and that's the book we talk about in this conversation. It's a fantastic book. Um, I read it in a couple sittings. Um, I really, really enjoyed it um, for a variety of reasons, which we talk about in the conversation. We start by talking about why he wanted to write the book and how these four women came to know each other and, and why they really kind of landed on writing on ethics. Um, we talk about uh, how facts and values are different and the towering presence of Aristotle's philosophy. We talk about the environment of Oxford in the 1920s and how big uh, of a role was misogyny and sexism uh, during this period. We then kind of spend some time talking about, uh, briefly, uh, each of these uh, women's uh, lives and their ideas. We talk about the life and philosophy of Iris Murdoch. We talk about the philosophy in Anscombe and the impact of Wittgenstein, as she was a student of his and a research uh, assistant and, and colleague and good friend. We talk about the philosophy of Philippa Foote and her friendship with Anscombe. We talk about the many contributions of Mary Midgley and some of the ways in which she contributed to philosophical, philosophical thought and how she had an interdisciplinary kind of approach. Um, just, just absolutely incredible life and incredible ways of talking about philosophy in different disciplines. And we end the conversation by talking about whether these women saw themselves as feminists. Do they like that term? Do they not? And what is their enduring legacy within philosophy? Um, I mentioned it in the conversation of, you know, why don't enough people uh, hear about these pretty awesome women and their ideas? And uh, we talk about that and some of the reasons for that and really how Benjamin and, and others are trying to make that not the case anymore. Um, so the, the book is The Women Are Up To Something. It's fantastic. And uh, I encourage everyone to pick it up. And so now I bring you Benjamin Lipscomb. I'm here with Benjamin Lipscomb. Ben, thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me on, Xavier. Yeah, yeah, you've written a, a fantastic book. Um, I've actually seen it uh, online. People have shared it and said they love it. So um, there's you're doing something right. Uh, <laughs> Fine. The the book is called "The Women Are Up to Something: How Elizabeth Anscombe, Philippa Foot, Mary Midgley, and Iris Murdoch Revolutionized Ethics." That just came out what two three months ago, if that. Beginning in November. Yeah. Um, it's a great book. Uh, I probably read it in two or three sittings. Um, it's fabulous. So uh, tell us just a little bit about who you are and why you wrote the book, and then uh, we'll get into it. Well, I uh, teach at a little liberal arts college in western New York State out in the countryside, about an hour and 15 minutes from any city. Uh, and in addition to teaching philosophy here, I direct our honors programs. So mm -hmm. periodically I take a group of students over to London for a semester. And I love it. Um, it's not the kind of place that places high tenure expectations on faculty. And that played into this book. These were women who I'd been reading uh, from my graduate school years in the 1990s forward and always admired them personally, uh, what I knew of their stories and thought that their work was compelling, but I didn't know how intimately interconnected their lives were until I read Mary Midgley's uh, wonderful memoir, The Owl of Minerva, which she published in 2005. As soon as I saw that, and she includes just, you know, a smattering of pages about her relationship to these other women, how they all went through Oxford together during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. I thought, there's a story here and it might even, I might even be lucky enough for it to fall to me to tell this story because it's gotta be a story about ideas mm -hmm. and it's gotta be a story about these women and their lives and times and friendships. And frankly, somebody who works at a research one 
institution uh, teaching philosophy is going to need to be writing those articles that hone the cutting edge of some technical subspecialty. And so they won't have time for the archival and interview work. They won't be interested enough in the biography. And a typical journalist or historian isn't going to be versed enough in the philosophy to want to take it on. But I thought there's this wonderful confluence here. I'd love for there to be such a book. So I'm going to start writing it. Yeah, no, it's just wonderful. Yeah, I think it's, um, it is a fascinating story. I had no idea their lives were connected. Um, and I know, I think out of the four women, uh, Anscombe is the one I know the most. I know a little bit of Iris Murdoch, so that I was learning about the other two as well. Um, and it's, it's great. I like the way you, you tell the story. Um, so, you know, you, you start the book by giving this chapter in the beginning to facts and values, which is kind of, I see a nice preamble to the lies and philosophies of, of these women. Uh, why do you think, uh, in a certain way, that whether they chose to or they just kind of fell into it, um, these four women in different ways chose to emphasize uh, ethics and morals in their thinking? You know, when you're doing philosophy or you're doing writing, you kind of, you know, can choose in some ways or you, you kind of pick, okay, where do I want to spend my time at? And uh, it seems like they, in a way, um, really emphasize ethics and morals in their thinking and writing. So what do you think was uh, going on there for why they chose that? Well, I'm really interested about this question. Um, somebody said to me recently after reading the book uh, that several of them seem to have gotten dragged against their initial intentions into writing about ethics. Hmm. And I think that's true too. All of them ended up making these really important contributions to 20th century ethical thought. And multiple of them didn't set out to do this. Mm -hmm. But thought she was going to work on Locke and Kant and their theories of knowledge, and uh, then was derailed uh, by her reactions to what she saw her male peers saying uh, about ethics and thinking that can't be right. Elizabeth Anscombe would have been contented, I think, to be a translator and commentator on Wittgenstein, her mentor, mm -hmm. and to pursue various kinds of puzzles in the theory of knowledge herself. And then Oxford University proposed to give an honorary degree to Harry Truman, and she was incensed and <laughs> began working on a pamphlet and speeches opposing this and thinking about, why are my contemporaries so messed up on questions of the ethics of war? But I think we can say that people of their generation, children of 1919, 1920, people who came of age right before the Second World War, it was like the present, a politically and morally tumultuous time. The Spanish Civil War had been on and people had been trying to sort out their minds about what to think about Stalin and uh, what had become of the Russian Revolution and Hitler was on the march, and it was a time of high passions and high engagement in politics. And I think this meant that all of them were inclined to be interested in questions about how should we live individually and collectively. Mm, yeah, I, I think it's it is interesting. They have they have similar ways of, of kind of, they kind of end up in the same zip code in terms of the content area, but how they got there, there is some dragging, there is some detours that they take, but they all kind of write about it, which I thought is, is really a, a nice thread here. Uh, j just briefly, there's two questions here is uh, you, you kind of, before you get into any of the history and, and some of their philosophy, you define facts, values, opinions, and why there's this kind of dichotomy between uh, you know, facts and values. Uh, just tell us a little bit about that and then some of the natural philosophy of Aristotle. Just kind of give us the, the, the brief overview because that kind of sets up the rest of the uh, content. Sure. The, the orthodoxy among these women's male peers, uh, the orthodoxy among philosophers generally before they came along and entered the profession was subjectivist about ethics. It saw ethical judgments, judgments of good and bad, right and wrong, better and worse, uh, actions or characters or whatever. The orthodox view was that these are 
all kind of made up artificial projections onto the world. And so another way of putting that is that there is a dichotomy between facts and values. This again is the view that they found themselves confronting at the start of their careers. The idea that what's true, what we can simply say is the case, facts, is one thing and anything about good and bad, better and worse, right and wrong, those can't be facts. Those are projections of ours, subjective attitudes that we take up toward the facts. And this was deeply unsatisfying uh, to these women. Philippa Foote, whom I've already mentioned, upon seeing the films coming back from the liberation of the concentration camps in Germany, thought, I've got to be able to say something other than Hitler had different values mm -hmm. than I do. Uh, I need to find a way to say that he and his minions were getting something terribly wrong and getting it wrong objectively, that there's a right and a wrong here. Hmm. Um, what Aristotle has to do with this is that Aristotle's ethics, which all of these women and all of the male contemporaries studied in university, was part of the standard curriculum. Yeah. Aristotle's ethics doesn't segregate, doesn't dichotomize facts and values in this way. Aristotle sees values, sees good and bad as more facts about the world, uh, things that we can get correct or incorrect, right or wrong. And uh, I can go more into sort of how Aristotle thinks about these matters, but he's thinking about us as a certain kind of animal that succeeds or fails in living the characteristic life of our kind based on the traits we acquire and the ways we exhibit them so that when we talk about a human being doing well or badly we are talking about facts we're talking about the kind of creatures we are and what we need and the conditions on our success as the kind of creatures we are mm -hmm. and so for for these uh, four women they take a little bit of a different path from aristotle yeah there's 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 some there's some overlap for sure, but maybe just talk about the 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 differences and similarities they have with that. Yeah, well, Iris Murdoch, who is part of this friend group and has a lot of agreements with the others, that she's much more inspired by Plato uh, than the other three are, and so they take they take inspiration from different figures, but Anscombe and Foote in particular think that Aristotle gets us towards something essential, that as we think about human lives, we should think about what makes them go well or badly. And we should identify those traits of character, those virtues or vices that enable us to succeed in the characteristic pursuits of human beings or that hinder us, get in our way in the characteristic pursuits of human beings. So courage or generosity or self-restraint, these are qualities you need in order to, you might say, do the human thing well in the way that a wolf needs sharp teeth and strong legs and a good nose in order to do the wolf thing mm -hmm. well. Anscombe and Foote both thought that's pretty close to right. Mary Midgley, who went much more deeply into biology mm -hmm. than any of her friends did, uh, modified this in some ways and came up with a kind of distinctive uh, view of her own, which drew on Aristotle, but wasn't as closely tied to his. And Iris Murdoch believed in a deeply out of fashion way in something like Plato's form of the good, this ideal that transcends us that we try to keep our eyes on as we live. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how a certain, I mean, everyone has to kind of, if you're doing philosophy or even sometimes just the humanities, you know, Aristotle is kind of the big, the big guy you have to deal with at some point. It's interesting how not only with how their lives diverged into different, you know, different ways and what they were doing, but also what the shape of the environment was, you know, war, you know, their upbringing, and then also, you know, how they were dealing with some kind of philosophy proper, how they kind of, you know, push and pull from some of the, the aspects of Aristotle's good um, and, and, and such. So it's, it's, it's very important, I think, that, that people understand that, you know, Aristotle is kind of the big looming figure here for them, not the only one, but uh, one, of, one of the primary ones. 
I would add that for both Anscom and Foote, the ones who are closest in their thinking to Aristotle, each of them, I think, owed even more of a debt to Aristotle's medieval Christian interpreter, Thomas Aquinas, mm -hmm. who has a much more fine grained discussion of particular virtues and vices. Mm -hmm. And both of them found this really congenial, mm -hmm. the way that Aquinas will talk about a vice like loquacity, being too chattery, never shutting up, never pausing to think and to listen, mm -hmm. and talk about how that gets in your way as a human being, trying to collaborate with other human beings on characteristic human activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So give us a sense of the climate in, in Oxford uh, and just kind of in general, but especially for women in the early 20th century, kind of what was, what was that like? Um, and what was it like to, you know, as, as, as best you can, you know, understand, you know, to be a woman, you know, in, in that kind of uh, context. There's a lot to say here. I mean, when these four went up to Oxford as undergraduates, you could count on your 10 fingers uh, you wouldn't need them all. The number of women in the last generation who had taken on philosophy as a profession sure. and in the speaking world, it's just a smattering of people. And they're the kind of people who just couldn't have imagined themselves doing anything else. I think people who were utterly driven to it, didn't care that it was out of fashion, didn't need any mentors or examples to lead the way. And then you have these four come along at the same moment and have a very unusual experience of Oxford with all the men called away to war and they all go into the profession together. But the context before them was one in which they didn't really have a lot of examples to look to and that makes a difference, that kind of representation uh, as we call it now. Mm -hmm. There were boys clubs within uh, the Oxford scene and doubtless at other places as well. One of the leading discussion groups just before uh, and during their undergraduate years was called the Brethren. And the name kind of says it all, this mm -hmm. gathering of some of the top men uh, in the philosophy subfaculty. And later on, as they're getting their careers launched, same thing over again, J.L. Austin, the most distinguished uh, figure in the Oxford philosophical scene. He's got this gathering every Saturday morning that he runs uh, for his junior colleagues. People jokingly called it Austin's playgroup or Austin's kindergarten. And it was the men who were invited, not these women. So they are a little bit marginalized socially. And, you know, this came out of a background that's got lots of other manifestations that I quote in the book, a dean of Somerville College where three of the four attended at Oxford saying, you know, you need to be really careful how you behave here because the women are on probation at this university. You might not think it matters how you behave, but it really does. You could, you could cause trouble for us. You could damage the position of women at this university. Uh, that's a heavy load to carry, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but that was the situation. Yeah. I guess on that, I guess some, I mean, you, you can, whatever evidence you have, or, or maybe your own opinion, since you have a closer reading to this, how much of that at the time in, in England was a result of, you know, misogyny or sexism, you know, was there active keeping women out, right? Like you don't belong here. You belong somewhere else. How much of that was an active thing that was, that was going on or was it, you know, this is just kind of an all boys club, you know, there's just not kind of what you're describing a little bit, you know, there's not really women here that are representing, you know, um, for, for women. And so there's not really a kind of uh, a place, you know, that can kind of seemingly be there. And or was it just not as much of an interest, meaning uh, not that women aren't interested in philosophical ideas, but is it that there was not an interest in doing philosophy proper um, at the time. Uh, so I guess I'm trying to just think of like three or four different answers to uh, that question. Um, what, what is the most accurate way we can, we can say about that time period and why there was a limited amount of, of women in, in, uh, in Oxford circles with philosophy? Well, that's a good question. I don't know whether I can answer it definitively, but I could say a few things. Mm -hmm. There's some out and out misogyny. Uh, sure. There's a sort of chatty guidebook to Oxford that comes out in 1939 by a guy who dies in the war, 
Um, and it is full of these snarky, dismissive remarks about uh, the women of Oxford and how aggravating they are in various ways. So that's that's open and on the page. But I think more commonly, that other thing you said is what goes on, that the men just don't think of or envision women or feel like they would be as comfortable if they invited them. And so without thinking women are bad, women shouldn't be doing this, they just invite their friends. They invite the people that sort of imagine joining the group and it's all men and it doesn't occur to them that there's an exclusion going on. And part of this is subtle gatekeeping. Mm -hmm. That's a standard path to entering philosophy as a profession at Oxford, the standard degree you'd take if this was an interest of yours was a classics degree. And the classics degree had prerequisites. You had to have really excellent, uh, pretty high level uh, Latin and Greek coming in, which totally makes sense if you're gonna do a classics sure, degree sure. to have some Latin and Greek already. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But when you marry those requirements to proceeding on in philosophy, then you get a situation where only people who have gone to schools that really push Latin and Greek yeah. are ever going to produce philosophers, even if there's other people who might be interested in the subject. Mm -hmm. And so when the people, when the faculty around Oxford in the 1930s envisioned a philosopher, it was likely to be a man that they envisioned, not out of malice, but out of that being the only ones they'd seen, the only ones who tended to come with the kind of preparation, because girls' schools didn't tend to feature Latin and Greek in the same way that boys' secondary schools did. Mm, yeah, I guess just on a personal note, uh, I don't know if you've got this question or not, but you know, I'll I'll, I'll state the obvious. You know, we have two dudes talking about uh, four women uh, in in their philosophy. So, <laughs> how, you know, not that either one of us are mansplaining, obviously, but. Um, what what was that like for you? I mean, to 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 write, you know, just as as a, as a guy to to write uh, uh, a book about four women in philosophy, knowing that they were pretty strong minority. What was that like? And an American, right? Uh, <laughs> right, yeah, and an American, not even British. <laughs> um, it was a thing I thought about along the way, and it was important to get good counsel on work and draft, to talk to lots of people, uh, women and men both, but especially women and especially Brits about, uh, am I getting this right? Uh, what do you think of my take on this? I will take this as an occasion to prospectively promote another book that's coming out in not very long by two British women, mm, nice. um, whom I met in 2016 as I was in the middle of this project and they were also very interested in these same figures. They got a book coming out in the UK in February and in the United States in May. Uh, it's called Metaphysical Animals, uh, Rachel Wiseman and Claire McCool. Nice. And it's gonna have a, as I understand it, a rather different timeline and focus that they're looking at the years 1937 to 1957. Mm -hmm. So just from the start of university, age for these four to just as they're getting launched on their major contributions, that kind of formative couple of decades. Um, but I think it's going to be great. And uh, I did wonder, you know, I was I was so far along at this point, I'm like, well, I'm not going to stop. And it sounds sure. like they're doing something different. But I think it's good that there's going to be that book with a different focus and with different kinds of authors, too. Yeah. Um, but it's a thing. I mean, I don't know what to say about it other than the, yeah, I thought about that and I thought, what are the things I can do? Like when, when we think about any of these um, forms of bounded rationality mm -hmm. that people are so focused on uh, these days, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what can you do but say, hmm, that's a thing. Let me be as conscious of it as I can and let me get people to help me see myself better than I can maybe see myself unaided. Cer certainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and again, just, just to clarify i asked the question only because it's kind of an obvious thing but i definitely think that it's important to have you know different perspectives that are going to have a different you know viewpoint that is going to say hey you know you know there's there's uh there's this history and there, you know here's what's going on from my vantage point and here are other people that are also from a different vantage point so i think they're all valid uh, not to invalidate yeah. it but it's and I think kind of, lots of people should appreciate these four philosophers, and I do. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, 
I'm glad there's going to be multiple books out. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's great. I think it's it's also interesting. I said this before that um, sometimes you know, I talk to a lot of different people and someone will have a book come out and <clears throat> they'll talk to like six different podcasts kind of it seems like in the same two weeks. And, you know, I don't typically listen to the other ones because I just kind of want to keep it kind of, you know, pure and doing my thing. And so then I'll go back afterwards and I'll listen to it. And I'm like, wow, like that's the same person. Like, wow, that's crazy. Like I had a conversation with them. They talked about all this stuff and this person highlighted this and then they go and have three other conversations and it sounds like it's a different person. So I think there's a lot of value and merit in that. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So all four women, uh, had many things in common, right? You think you talk about this in the book of they were middle class, they had some unstable culture at the time, the impact of religion, etc. Do you think maybe unconsciously, right? Do you think that some of those things united them? What were some of the elements that were different for them? You know, what what were these you know kind of uniting factors uh, just for them as people, um, and then and or their ideas, and then what were some of the ways in which they kind of uh, were different? Okay, yeah, they, they're mostly middle class, but they all converge on a certain kind of educated middle class life um, that they end up sharing and that three of the four of them came out of in the first place. Philippa Foote is born to immense privilege that she's a granddaughter of a US president and uh, a daughter of younger son of, of the gentry. Uh, she grows up in a home in North Yorkshire where she's not allowed to play with the uh, with the village children. The daughters of waiting of ladies in waiting to the queen would be fit playmates, but others not. But she longs to escape this mm -hmm. and ends up going to Oxford when a governess of hers tells her, you know, you could go to university. And so she's got her sights set on this more middle class educated kind of life. And the others are all more or less born to families that aspire to that, that value that. And I think that's, that they're all Oxford people is an important uniting element, that they're part of this middle-class, upper-middle-class intelligentsia, mm -hmm. uh, uh, educated public, mm -hmm. and speaking to that public. And that's a bigger slice of British culture at the time then I think it's easy to appreciate today. Mm -hmm. One of the things that struck me most working on this is how much philosophy was on the BBC, how much philosophy was on the radio mm -hmm. uh, in the center of the 20th century. And I think I might want to write a book about this at mm -hmm. some point, but they are speaking to and for and with a pretty sizable portion of their public, that Oxford is part of a public conversation at this time in a way that I think it's not as much now. Um, I think that's changed, that the expectation that intellectual life and public life are seamless has, uh, has eroded. Yeah, I would say that maybe there's an element of that sort of you have these kind of quasi intellectuals that sometimes use youtube as a nice medium so maybe sure. that's our version of it but yes uh -huh. it does it does seem it does seem that you know on the radio or whatever you know having that kind of front and center is you know we, we just don't see that now and, and so that it is interesting in terms of what you think about the impact that has for for culture you know i, I would love to turn on the radio now and, and hear more philosophy and less of you know whatever disc jockey or whatever so um uh -huh. you know so i, I want to just jump to um the kind of the individual portraits so just as a footnote here you know the first half of the book essentially is kind of the setup for these these women's lives and, and their their ideas and then you devote basically a chapter to each uh woman which that had to have been extremely hard to synthesize and write i mean you could write whole biographies on each one of these women so you know kudos to you for just you know getting into a very good 20 pages or whatever it is you know um, that's that had to have been very difficult so you know i think you, you start with murdoch you know her story is somewhat unconventional from the others in terms of like how she doesn't necessarily do formal uh, philosophy and she you know, writes novels and things like that um how much do you think 
at the, in the beginning, she did study philosophy and was really influenced by Jean-Paul Sartre, de Beauvoir. There were huge influences on her thought, uh, their brand of existentialism. How much of that influence in the early beginnings, uh, something that impacted her later in, in her writing? Oh, it's central. Um, Murdoch, from the very beginning of her professional career, just as soon as she was out of her undergraduate years and launching off into her life, she aspired to be part of an international intellectual and writerly community. And so she wanted to know what was going on with the Germans and the Russians, and especially the French, uh, who captured her imagination, as well as uh, the intellectuals of Great Britain. This is really important to her. And it enables her to make the contribution she does to the implicit common project that she and her friends worked out over decades, that she's not the one who develops the Aristotle inspired theory of ethics. She's not the one who suggests a worked out replacement uh, or even a very detailed critique mm -hmm. of uh, what most of the men of their generation went in for but she's the one who identifies the cultural mindset, the background presuppositions about facts and values uh, that are not even consciously driving the thought of her male contemporaries, driving the orthodox view. And for that, she needed to know something other than the immediate technical discussion among uh, British philosophers in the Anglophone world. She needed to have a sense of what the French were saying, which was so like in certain ways, what the British were saying, even though they weren't reading one another. Mm -hmm. And that knowing both groups, knowing both sides so well enables her to say, there's something more going on here. What is it? What is this spirit of the age that is issuing in such similar conclusions in such different kinds of vocabulary? And, and you, you say that she takes a pragmatist viewpoint on ethics. Can you explain what that is and, and how she kind of viewed ethics in this kind of practical way um, and, and how she's fitting that within this kind of existentialism and how you know, kind of these two camps, you know, this, the British philosophers and French philosophers, how they're kind of all coming at this uh, kind of mindset. Did I use the word pragmatist? I believe so. I believe so. Yes. Okay. Um... Or you could just say just a kind of like how her viewpoint of ethics uh, was fashioned with some of these, you know, French and British uh, uh, counterpoints here. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, I think I might have hesitated to use that word because it's got these associations with a particular American school. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. But she was very concerned that ethics speak to the existential longings and anxieties of late modern people. She saw this really clearly in the French figures and saw a lack of this in some of her British contemporaries, that they were doing these fine grained logical analyses of language. And although that stuff was motivated in some ways, by some shared presuppositions with the French, and she spotted this in a way that nobody else did. Nonetheless, it could seem very dry, very disconnected from the political agitation uh, of her times. Mm -hmm. And she longed for a philosophy that would be engaged, mm -hmm. that would speak to people who were living through times of open conflict and wondering what to do with themselves. And in that sense, she wanted a practical philosophy. I'm not gonna get the quote right here, but of Gilbert Ryle, one of the leading British philosophers in the 1940s and into the 50s, she says, he represents life as being about remembering your shopping list and going to the circus. And she said, what is there in this philosophy to speak to people who are thinking about and wanting to talk about sinning and wanting to talk about joining the Communist Party and wanting to talk about betraying or keeping fidelity uh, to their true love. Um, this is 
uh, this is so desiccated. This is so removed from the most vital and pressing questions that we have existentially. I think I would use the word existential uh, mm -hmm. to talk about her concerns rather than pragmatist, but if I think we might be on the same page here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I'm going to save uh, Wittgenstein uh, for, for the next person we, we'll, we'll bring up, but uh, she definitely was influenced by Wittgenstein as well, But so we can kind of... Uh, We'll was, talk yeah. about her her influence, um, uh, you know, with the the next um, woman, which was uh, Anscombe. So obviously, I mean, what well, I'm going to butcher the quote myself, but there was something like, "There's no thought that I have that isn't influenced by Wittgenstein" or something like that. I mean, she was heavily influenced by him, worked with oh, yeah. him. Uh, it, it was just tremendous. I mean, just just absolutely tremendous. In fact, I think some folks, I mean, you would know more than I would, have associated some of his stuff as really Anscombe's writing, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that whole kind of, did she get credit for it kinds of things. And, and that was definitely a, a real challenge back then. But I guess, what was it about Wittgenstein uh, personally and philosophically that drew her uh, to him? Obviously, she has this kind of, you know, Catholic upbringing, which is an interesting story you talk about, uh, or excuse me, uh, Catholic um a belief system that was kind of different from her from her own parents upbringing yeah, a radical conversion yeah. yeah yeah and i know wittgenstein was not i don't know if did was he labeled a catholic but he definitely flirted with elements of it so i mean maybe there was that but what was it personally and philosophically that that kind of connected them and, and allowed them to work together and etc okay it's wittgenstein's deadly earnest seriousness mm -hmm. his radically self-critical approach to philosophy, to getting uh, at philosophical truth, that he seems to have approached getting things right about language and knowledge and the world as being a kind of spiritual quest. And I think that, above anything else, resonated with Anscombe. She, she's one of the ones who would have been a philosopher like the smattering of women uh, in the generation before her. She's one of the ones who would have been a philosopher no matter what. Mm -hmm. She needs someone to show her that this was possible. I think she was heading there from her teenage years. She describes picking up a book of natural theology, of kind of philosophical theology, mm -hmm. uh, as a teenager and coming across an argument in this book that everything that happens has to have a cause and getting obsessed with this and writing version after version after version of the proof herself because she's not satisfied with the way it is in the book and she thinks she can make it work. Mm -hmm. That's Elizabeth Hanscom, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, gripped by philosophical questions, unable to let them go, obsessed with getting to the bottom of them. And Wittgenstein took these questions as seriously as she did, mm -hmm. was as gripped by them as she was, and because she was kind of tormented by these questions, couldn't always see how to answer them and couldn't let them go, that Wittgenstein's focus on philosophy as therapy, mm -hmm. that sometimes what we need to do is to let go of a background presupposition that's making a question seem necessary and unanswerable and get to a point where we can see, oh, we don't need to ask or answer that question or not in the way that we thought we needed to ask or answer it. And at one point, Anscombe writes that in classes and in conversations with Wittgenstein, it was like she saw a nerve being extracted, like from a sore tooth, mm. that this thing that was raging inside her, that was aching inside her, got taken care of to where she could let it go, where she could see, oh, I can think about this quite differently than I have been and be less consumed by it. So you've got somebody who cares as deeply as she does, who made his whole thing about helping people to see their way around their gripping obsessions philosophically. And this was exactly what she needed. Mm, yeah. She, she, she talks about uh, uh, the, this idea of is versus ought and uh, maybe just kind of, you know, kind of her contribution of, of, of her specific ideas here. What, what was she meaning by this and, and why was it important to her? Okay, part of the orthodoxy, the dogma uh, that most of these women's male contemporaries went in for, part of this way of thinking about facts and values that they had was what 
was casually referred to as Hume's law from a passage in David Hume's writing that you can't go from is statements to ought statements, that there's a leap there and that seeing that it's a leap helps you to appreciate that there's a dichotomy between facts and values. But if you've got a bunch of is statements and then you try to say what ought to be done, what should be done, what would be best to be done, you're going to be introducing this new idea that you couldn't legitimately infer from the is statements, the factual statements that you'd be making. You can't go from facts to values, another way of putting the same point. And she thought, well, let's consider that. Can you go from is to needs? It seems like the same sort of objection, the same line of reasoning should lead you to think you can't go from is to needs. You've got all these is statements about, say, a plant. It is uh, going to wilt if it doesn't have certain nutrients in the soil or if it doesn't get watered or if it doesn't get sunlight, all sorts of factual statements you can make about it. But surely we can say what a plant needs and that's not fishy. That's not uh, something suspect. It's a different kind of inference than we're used to maybe, but it's not uh, sketchy. And it looks like it's the same kind of inference that we would make if we went from is to ought, from facts to values. Mm. So she saw her male contemporaries as having got hung up on this underexamined logical idea. And she said, there's, there's all kinds of inference we do from is to needs, from is to owes, from is to ought. Mm -hmm. And we can get past the idea that there is no such uh, inference that can be legitimate. And then we can start thinking about how do facts instruct us about what's best for human beings? Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's very powerful in, to, to, in ways of how she's trying to analyze uh, how these things work. So I will, we'll keep moving. Uh, Philippa Foote, um, what was it about her and her temperament that works so well with Anscombe philosophically and personally? And, and the, yeah. talk a little bit about their dynamics and then some of Foote's kind of uh, philosophy on, on her own. Okay, philosophically and personally, both, yes. They're colleagues for over two decades at Somerville College, Oxford. Anscombe went to St. Hughes as an undergraduate, but then she goes to work at Somerville alongside Foote, who had been an undergraduate there. And this was the premier, uh, one of the women's colleges at Oxford. And they fall into this practice of every weekday afternoon, sitting down together in the senior common room, the faculty lounge, and talking philosophy all afternoon long. And for foot, this was just like life, water and air, <laughs> that she carried a heavy teaching load. And though she was dissatisfied with what her uh, male contemporaries were saying about ethics, she didn't see what she could put in its place. And it was in the context of these day after day after day interactions with Anscombe that she started working out what did she really think. Anscombe was by common acknowledgement the most analytically brilliant of these four women. Uh, uh, the generation uh, making philosopher out of the four of them. And Foote essentially apprenticed herself mm -hmm. to Anscombe over this, uh, over this time period and came to her own insights, which were genuinely her own, through constantly testing them in these afternoon conversations that were standing in, in part, for the kind of thing that Austin was doing with the men on his Saturday mornings. Uh, this doing philosophy live together, not just with your undergraduate pupils, but with a peer who could stretch and challenge you. But I think what Foote does in return for Anscombe is twofold. First of all, because Anscombe's so serious about philosophy, so serious about getting to the truth, which she saw, I think, in religious terms, that in getting at the truth, we are discovering things about God and how God made the world, that there's a religious devotion uh, in this for her. And Foote was as serious about this as she was, and that made her Anscombe's kind of person. But also, 
Elizabeth Anscombe was deeply unconventional and combative both. She was a person who was often at war with the world mm -hmm. and who really stood out, wore this kind of duffel coat and sometimes shorts underneath it and sandals <laughs> and had an extropic eye that she would sometimes cover with an eye patch. She was conspicuous and she was, as I say, uh, combative, uh, irascible, would get into uh, conflicts with peers and with the world that she saw as wrong about important things uh, morally and religiously. And Foote, who adored, who venerated Anscombe, despite the fact that Foote's an atheist and Anscombe is this devout uh, conservative Catholic, Foote was so polished from her upper class upbringing. She got along so easily with everyone that I think she was a bridge from Anscombe to the rest of their social world. It was really hard to cut her off too much when she's associated with one of the most elegant and easy to get along with people around Oxford. And Foote at one point, I'll just add this because it's a wonderful story, wonderful testimony to the kind of friend Foote was. Um, at one point, Foote offers to resign in order to preserve Anscombe's job, knowing that Anscombe was perceived as personally difficult by so many of their peers, knowing that it was gonna be hard for her to get a job if Somerville turned her loose, but Somerville was finding itself without the resources to keep them both on at full salary. And Foote said, fine, can I give up part of my salary because I won't be able to respect myself wow. if the best philosopher maybe of our time uh, is unemployed and I keep my job. Wow, yeah, that's... <laughs> that's a hell of a friend <laughs> yeah that, that does say a lot about yeah kind of her, her big personality and and just really kind of kind of applying some of the thoughts that she you know this wasn't just like you know thinking out loud i mean there's some kind of way of living this kind of ways of doing things as well it's just it's really it's really it, it puts more to it i think than than just here's some cool ideas or here's some really sharp ideas these are uh, deep principled people yeah 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 Okay, so so lastly, uh, Mary uh, Midgley. Uh, so I just say you say in the book. So you had a chance to talk with her um, herself. Um, I think she passed in 2018. Am I right on this? That's right. And, yeah. And and so I guess you know you were got to talk to her in the twilight years. And uh, just what was that like? I mean, you're writing a book on. I mean, I mean that kind of just feels like you know you're kind of going backwards in time you know this is back to the you know early um you know 20th century i mean just what was that like and getting to ask her a lot of these things and about you know her ideas and then also with her friends you know what was what was that like yeah how i wish that i had been able to go on talking with her right to the end of the project but yeah she died a little after her 99th birthday mm -hmm. a long and full life mm -hmm. um but it was delightful. She was so hospitable, so generous with her time and with uh, other sorts of resources that I think it was my second visit uh, up to Newcastle to talk with her. And she always fed her visitors uh, a simple vegetarian lunch and biscuits and tea. And uh, I was talking with her and she said, well, I've got these things in my filing cabinet, you know, old, copies of talks that I gave on the BBC. Would that be of interest to you? Yes. <laughs> so with her permission, I took things over to the local public library and scanned and copied things off. And wow. it gave me a much deeper sense. So this stuff is hard to find now, all in the Jeff and Mary Mitchley archive, University of Durham. But at the time, it was just piled up in this filing cabinet wow. uh, in her house. And the trust that she showed early on, thinking, okay, he's a good egg. I, I, uh, uh, I can see that uh, he's doing something uh, important or that it's important to him and I'm gonna support him. Uh, I was so grateful for this. Yeah, no, that's, that's I mean, that has to you know, just kind of pinch yourself the whole time. Just like, wow, you know. Um, and in and, and talking about her, she, she did seem like a, her work was kind of a multidisciplinary work. As you mentioned earlier, she would, had an emphasis on, on more of the biology of things. You know, what, what would you say, I guess, is her, 
you know, major contribution to philosophical philosophical thought and ideas. Um, obviously, she had disagreements with Dawkins, which, you know, we don't have to get into all the weeds of, but she definitely was trying to engage different types of folks and different types of uh, uh, disciplines. You know, what would you say is like her, her main contribution, I guess, to, to this kind of world? She's an amazing and hard to summarize figure. Um, her career is offset from that of her university friends in a way that I think makes people not recognize sometimes that they are a cohort mm -hmm. together, that she publishes the first of her 16 books yeah. at the end of her 50s mm -hmm. in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. And there's several strains to her authorship. She's an important writer in animal ethics. Mm -hmm. um, she is an important writer about science and religion and how we think sometimes religiously about science in ways that we need to be careful about. And she's got this stream of her thought on, uh, on moral philosophy, on ethics that mm -hmm. interests me most in this book. There, I think her contribution is to make a positive proposal that her university friends were unable to make because they didn't have the same biological uh, background that she acquired during the years that she was taking off to raise her boys. Mm -hmm. uh, from around 1950 to 1965, she's at home with her sons as they're growing up, and she's reading all of these animal behavior studies and relating them both to what she sees the boys doing on the hearth rug and to the philosophy that she knew and uh, had dug into in an earlier phase of her career so that when she's ready to go back into the philosophy classroom and start writing philosophy again, she's got these two bodies of knowledge that she can integrate. Hmm. Murdoch, Anscombe, Foote, all three of them had critiqued the thought of their male peers all three of them had in different ways to different extents suggested what a constructive direction would be to go. We need to think more about the kinds of animals we are and what is good for us as the kinds of animals we are, the traits that enable us to succeed as the kinds of animals we are. They'd issued promissory notes for that kind of thinking. They'd made moral truth moral objectivity thinkable again. Uh, they'd suggested that the argument that there could be no such thing was not as strong as it had been supposed to be. But Midgley's the one who actually works out a positive proposal. Here's what that could be like, drawing on uh, studies of other animals and analogies that we see emerge from those studies about human beings. Mm. It'd be interesting. I, I wonder how much uh, towards the towards the end of her life she was, you know, how much she was still studying. But there has been in the past, uh, I'd say 10, 15, 20 years, a lot of work on uh, cooperation and how our evolutionary psychology tells us about cooperation with other animals and how it tells us what, how, how we can make some sense of that uh, w with us as humans. And so uh, it would be if <laughs> interesting if uh, where, where, what her pulse would be on some of those things. Yeah, she is very interested in the diversity of traits and ground motivations mm -hmm. that our evolutionary history has bequeathed to us. Mm -hmm. And what she stood against, what got her into a fight with Dawkins, uh, what she stood against whenever she detected it was a desire to reduce and simplify the range of our evolutionarily inherited motives mm -hmm. to only a certain kind, only particularly self-centered, uh, self-oriented ones. Mm -hmm. uh, she said there's this diversity of traits that are conducive to uh, the species uh, perpetuating itself. And you need to look at this whole range and see them as sometimes cross-cutting, pulling in different directions, but needing to be harmonized mm. by an animal, either by sort of fixed instincts, or in the case of human beings, what makes us distinctive is that we consciously reflect on and have to piece together strategies 
for putting together our sexuality and our aggression and our love of our kids and the ways that we're drawn to other people's kids and other people's needs mm -hmm. sometimes this whole welter of motives that needs to be harmonized in any human life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I want to respect your time, uh, Benjamin. So I, I have two final questions for you. Uh, the first question is, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, I think, um, an interesting question about these four women, which is, they were obviously influential in philosophy in the 20th century. You know, can we call them feminists? Would they want that label? Do they care? Uh, if not, why not? You know, how would they make sense of, of that kind of angle? I was recently talking, uh, after a lecture I gave, with a woman who's a historian of the mid 20th century and writing particularly about, I think it's women in uh, politics in the mid 20th century. Mm -hmm. And she said, it's interesting how many of them don't want this label. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, don't want to claim this, that sometimes they will be quite forthright yes. about ways they're being slighted mm -hmm. as women and not let these things slide but not want to be, I think what I see the attitude as being, not wanting to be pigeonholed. Right. Uh, I, the, the person that comes to mind is Hannah Arndt, who was very adamant that she did not want to be labeled a feminist. <laughs> you know, Hannah Arndt had some pretty, you know, she just made everyone upset. You know, she was the, the true independent thinker. But it, I do get that sense from, from a lot of uh, women uh, thinkers in, in the 20th century. Would you, would you say this for this group of women as well? Or what are your thoughts? Definitely holds for them. They, they don't engage much with the word feminist. Do we want that word? Do we not want that word? But mm -hmm. Philippa Foote, for instance, um, she illustrates this nicely. On the one hand, when she got an invitation, second half of her career was at UCLA, when she got an invitation to join the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and at the top, uh, it was addressed to Dear Sir, and she sent in her response with that sort of X'd out uh, on her typewriter and an accompanying note saying, you know, it's really weird for me to be addressed as sir and I'm not gonna be the only one, so can you fix it please? <laughs> and she came to the defense of women undergraduate and graduate students. She knew the way things could be in the world and she was concerned about these matters. But when Peter Conradi was writing his uh, authoritative biography of Iris Murdoch. And he was talking a lot with Phil the Foot because uh, she was such a close friend of Murdoch's. Mm -hmm. And at one point, there's a comment that she makes on some draft material he'd shown her where he talks about these women philosophers. And she says, do we have to be women philosophers? Mm -hmm. I would much rather be identified as part of a generation. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a push and a pull there where she sees that women are slighted, but she seems worried, yeah, about being boxed in, yeah. about being reduced to one thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I could definitely see that. I can, I can, I can see that uh, perspective. I guess the, the last question here is, is uh, they're, they're not as known in the 20th century. People usually think of Heidegger and Wittgenstein and Sartre and Merleau-Ponty maybe, and uh, you know, Derrida and Foucault and all these guys. Um, so they're less known. Uh, maybe some of that is because of the gender thing, but maybe also not. It could be other elements as well. I guess, what do you think, uh, two parts, why do you think they're less known, I guess, in the general corpus of, you know, philosophical text and thought in the 20th century? And what do you think are their major contributions to ethics, philosophy, and, and human nature? Okay, I'll take those in reverse order. Sure. I um, just want to underscore something I said a couple of minutes ago. I think the contribution is that they broke the older orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. um, you and your listeners may be familiar with Thomas Kuhn's work on the structure of scientific revolutions, how he says, we've got these paradigms that tend to control scientific inquiry for a long stretch and then from time to time get broken open and replaced. Mm -hmm. And I think there was something like a paradigm in ethics that everybody just worked within, didn't see that it would make sense to question. And what's huge about uh, these four philosophers is that they break that paradigm and that they make alternatives thinkable. And there's a whole revolution of people doing different kinds of ethics 
Aristotelian ethics and care ethics of an explicitly feminist bent and other kinds. And I think it's these women who create the space uh, for that. Um, why don't they get, well, you know, there's only so many people who are epic making on a really, really large scale and, and maybe they aren't, but I think it's also certain qualities in their writing that make people maybe not perceive uh, at first how significant that they were. Um, Anscombe and Foote are both writers within the style, the approach of mid 20th century Anglophone philosophy. It's this close linguistic analysis uh, that the uh, philosophy proceeds out of and often consists in. And I think there's, what's uh, uh, the metaphor I want here? Um, there's a learning curve there. There's an initiation that uh, enables one to access that kind of material. Uh, and Anscombe in particular can be a very dense writer. When she's writing a pamphlet against Harry Truman, then she can be uh, incendiary and extremely lively and transmit to any audience. Mm -hmm. But when she's writing straight up philosophy, uh, her daughter, uh, Mary Geach Garmali, says in an introduction to a collection of her writings that my mother's writing is like Panfort. It's this really dense, chewy confection that you have to chew on a long time uh, to, to get down. And it's just right. Yeah, so yeah. there are costs to entry with Anscombe and even uh, to an extent with Foote. Mm. With Murdoch, she runs herself down as a philosopher. She gives herself a hard time as a philosopher. But I think people who encounter her philosophical writing, and, and consequently, she doesn't write as much philosophy as I think she might have. But people who do encounter her writings frequently find them inspiring. Mm. Um, I think if she didn't have self-confidence problems mm -hmm. that she had because of her time and place, I think she might be, I think she still could be regarded as one of the great uh, figures of the 20th century more popularly. I think that could happen still, mm -hmm. uh, wait and see. And with Minchley, it's that she's such a popularizer that she, because she's relating different bodies of knowledge to one another, mm -hmm. she says at one point, I can see that I have to speak about this in plain language. Mm. And I think she sometimes reads to people as being so plain spoken that she can't be doing anything epic making, that it's too sensible and too plain. Um, and I think people miss the novelty, the significance, the wisdom and insight mm -hmm. of what she has to offer because well, let me give this analogy. Um, Augustine in his confessions says that it took him a while to take the Bible seriously because it's so plain spoken. Mm -hmm. And I think Mary Midgley uh, is a bit like that for people. Yeah, that's, that's, I could see that. I could definitely see that. Well, the, the book is called The Women Are Up to Something, How Elizabeth Anscombe, Philip Foot, Mary Midgley, and Iris Murdoch Revolutionized Ethics. Uh, where can people find this and where can people find your work and all the right places to find you online and everything else? Well, uh, we have a delightful uh, and uh, slightly aggravating situation where the first printing in the UK and the US sold out. My understanding from the Oxford University Press people is that the second printing has uh, now issued in supplies again so um well that's a good thing that's i mean it's sold i mean it sold out the first press that's great that's I'm great so glad that so many people are paying attention to these yeah. flowers um it may be that there will be a little shipping delay as the back orders get shipped first mm -hmm. but it's available again i i know one can get it on uh, bookshop and amazon and mm -hmm. the rest a little harder to find in stores. I'm hoping that by Christmas or after Christmas, uh, that will be happening again. But I think I'd recommend online. Okay. And where can people find your work and find you online? Uh, where, where's the best place? Oh, various places. I, I am not a person who maintains a uh, a big platform. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, people can always email me. Uh, my email address is dead simple. It's Benjamin Lipscomb at Houghton. 
H-O-U-G-H-T-O-N.edu. And I try to follow the example of Iris Murdoch, who spent hours a day replying to people who wrote to her. Mm -hmm. I, I will write to anybody who writes to me, but I, I don't. Periodically, I engage in one-off blogging projects for a short time, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm on Goodreads, but I there's no big platform I maintain. Okay. All right. Well, look, Benjamin, this is, this is so much fun. I, I really enjoyed this. I loved your book. Um, and I really love talking with you about it. And uh, you're just a wealth of information and just uh, wonderful. So I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Dave. All righty. Thank you.